Now to another terrorism case. The Obama administration is facing increasing pressure tonight after Fox News reports about charges of threats and intimidation directed at against whistleblowers tied to the Benghazi terror attack. Some survivors and others with direct knowledge of the attack want to speak out. Today, the administration responded. Chief White House correspondent Ed Henry has the story. One day after President Obama said he was unaware of any potential whistleblowers wanting to come forward about the attacks in Benghazi, I'm not familiar with it. White House spokesman Jay Carney tried to turn the page on it once and for all. Let's be clear. Well, there, Benghazi happened a long time ago. We are unaware of any agency blocking an employee who would like to appear before Congress to provide information related to Benghazi. Except in an unfortunate bit of timing, it was only today the FBI released these surveillance photos of three individuals who were on the grounds of the U.S. mission in Benghazi when it was attacked, leading to the deaths of four Americans. Republican attorney Victoria Tunzing today continued to insist she has an unnamed client who is one of several government officials ready to challenge the administration's account of what happened. I'm a good lawyer. I don't talk in Perry Mason terms of blowing the lid off of something. I can tell you that with the various um, whistleblowers and the background that I know, there is information that is inconsistent with the administration's scenario for the attack on Benghazi. I would tell you that with certainty. Carney dismissed the idea that anyone is being muzzled and today pledged for the first time the White House will allow anyone who wants to testify to come forward. Anybody who wants to be heard by Congress is welcome to be heard by Congress in our view. And that has been our approach, our cooperative approach uh, to this matter. To poke holes in Tunzing's claims, the administration released new letters from the Departments of State and Defense stamped in the last 24 hours since Fox asked the president whether government employees are being blocked from speaking out. Ed, I'm not familiar with this notion that uh, anybody's been blocked from testifying. The new letters to Republican Congressman Darrell Issa in insist that neither department has received requests from any employees who allegedly want private attorneys to get security clearances for access to classified information about Benghazi. The State Department is playing cutesy with the wording, saying that the employee should come in and ask. In other words, the employee should go in without a lawyer and say, I want to be a whistleblower and would you help me find a lawyer? That's not how it should work. Back on April 26th, ISA wrote Secretary of State John Kerry that, quote, numerous individuals have come forward with information related to the Benghazi attack and may need personal attorneys with security clearances. Today, Republican Senators John McCain, uh, Lindsey Graham, and Kelly Ayotte uh, fired off a letter to the president terrible. demanding he provide the names of all of the survivors of the Benghazi attacks. Now, Victoria Tonsing, meanwhile, told me today she's willing to take on any Democratic co-counsel to join the case and show that it's nonpartisan. She wants her unnamed client to testify at ICE's next hearing on May 8th. Brett. Okay, Ed Henry live on the North Lawn. Ed, thank you. Much more on this with the panel. Tonight we conclude our three-part investigative series on the Benghazi attacks with an example of how not to respond to a crisis. Correspondent Adam Housley reports on accusations the Obama administration dropped the ball. What difference at this point does it make? <laughs> The lack of action in Benghazi makes a big difference to multiple sources on the ground that night and others who witnessed the events unfold. They had no plan. They had no contingency plans for what if this happens. And that's the problem that the State Department is going to face in the future. They're dealing uh, with more hostile regions, hostile countries. This attack's going to happen again. Our source, who was monitoring the events in Benghazi in real time, reveals the lack of reaction by the U.S. State Department, Pentagon, and the White House on the night four Americans were killed. He suggests more could have been done to save lives and asks were multiple security warnings ignored. This was the reason given by then Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta. That you don't deploy forces into harm's way without knowing. Uh, what's going on without having some real-time information about what's taking place. Uh, and as a result of not having that kind of information, uh, the commander who was on the ground or in, in that area, General Hamm, uh, General Dempsey, and I felt very strongly that we could not put forces at risk uh, in that situation. I could see the initial confusion in the beginning. You know, you have a situation that's developing. The problem with State Department is they don't have those procedures in place. And if they do, they haven't practiced or exercised them. 
and now you know they're they're making up for for all the mistakes they made with excuse and there is no excuse this is a breakdown between state and military yeah absolutely huge breakdown between state and military the state department and the defense department need to get on the same sheet of music our source says as events unfolded the night of the attack they fell under the authority of the chief of mission the person in charge of security in the country who in this case was ambassador chris stevens but once stevens was cornered and members of a security detail pushed his distress button that authority would have been transferred to his deputy however the deputy was out of the country that meant the authority then reverted directly to the u.s state department and oversight of the response to the attack fell to Secretary Clinton and Under Secretary of State for Management Patrick Kennedy. They were calling the shots, multiple State Department sources tell Fox, and Kennedy was in the operations center monitoring the radio traffic and distress call. We're also told by multiple sources that shortly after the attack began, around 9.40 p.m., Special Forces put out a call sign for all available assets, military and otherwise, in the vicinity to be moved into position to help. That enacts every asset, every element to respond, and it becomes a global priority. Was that given? I will tell you that was given, and the only reason it was given is because of the Special Operations Pact, because it has nothing to do with the agency. It has nothing to do with the Department of State. So Special Operations gave the call sign. Yes. But assets didn't move. Assets did not move. The failure of the State Department or White House to give the military permission to cross into Libya to help, according to our source, only accentuates the significant breakdown in communication between the State Department, the U.S. military, CIA, and White House that culminated in the lack of action the night of the Benghazi attack. The problem with State Department is, you know, you have a diplomatic function. The diplomatic function is to build rapport and commerce. And, and whatever foreign affairs um, element that's related to it. The military specifically does targeting. We specifically look at individuals. There's not good communication between the State Department and the Department of Defense on any level, absolutely no level. This claim contradicts the report of the State Department Accountability Review Board, which says in part, Washington, Tripoli, Benghazi communication, cooperation, and coordination on the night of the attacks were effective. It's horrible. When you're on the ground, you depend on each other. We're going to get through this situation. But when you look up and then uh, nothing outside of the stratosphere is coming to, to help you or rescue you, that's a, that's a bad feeling. Four American lives were lost that night and six others injured. My whole reason for sitting in this seat, if this could get somebody off their butt to uh, poke somebody in the chest to make a decision for my guys to do their job and to finish their job, uh, then I've, I've kind of feel like I've done my work here. Brett, he is the first source again to step in front of a camera and talk about Benghazi with direct connections. It took incredible courage to do so. He says he still feels threatened even though he gave us no classified information whatsoever. We do continue to talk to other sources that have connections that night. They yet have not uh, decided to step in front of a camera. Brett. Adam, excellent series of reports. And again, we welcome any folks to speak out on this story that we've been covering from the beginning. Adam, thank you.